And we're live. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the virtual presentation of If I Disappear with author Eliza Jane Brazier and moderator Kirsten White. Uh, this event includes an audience Q&A. So if you do have a question for our speakers, just use the ask a question button at the very bottom of the screen. You can also vote for any question you find interesting and they will find their way to the very top of the list. Also, we have signed book plates available. So if you would like to purchase a copy of the featured book tonight with the book plate, just make sure to write book plate in the comment section when you are completing your purchase on the website. So when you add the book to your cart, just scroll down and there should be a comment section and write book plate. And uh, Romans is 126 years old. We're the oldest independent bookstore in Southern California. So it is avid readers and generous patrons like yourselves uh, that keep our doors open. So any kind of support would, you know, we would really appreciate it. And uh, with that said, let me briefly introduce our guests for tonight, and then we will get started. So Eliza Jane Brazier is an author, screenwriter, and journalist. Uh, and if I Disappear is her adult debut novel, and she's currently developing it for television. And joining us tonight is Kirsten White, the New York Times bestselling and award-winning author of many books, including the And I Darken trilogy, the Camelot Rising trilogy, and the Sailor Slayer series. And uh, with that said, I'm going to turn off my camera and mic. Enjoy the talk, everyone. Yay. Thank you so much for having us. Oh, we're so excited <laughs> here. We're so excited that we get to hang out with you guys. Like that's the one upside to these events is that, you know, we're not we're no longer bound by geography, right? Um <laughs> So Eliza, <laughs> I'm so excited to do this with you. Um fun fact, Eliza and I have known each other since we were teenagers. We first met at 18 in college because I was dating her brother. And then I married her brother, so she's never gotten away from me since. <laughs> so this has just been so fun. And I love that this is a continuation. Like, Eliza and I, um, we're in the same bubble. And so we get to talk once a week. And we talk, like, writing and craft and publishing. And we're going a million miles an hour. And the family around us. <laughs> what are they talking about? Um, so it's fun that we get, to, we get to have that talk tonight. <laughs> Yeah, so you can listen to us go a mile a minute. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, I love once your dad was like, can you even understand yourself when you talk that fast? I'm like, <laughs> um, okay, so If I Disappear, which is your adult debut, um, first of all, yes, it is an incredible cover. Um, I love the cover so much. Oh. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so, okay, okay. I'm so excited to talk about this with you because I love this book and I love you. Um, so one of the things that I, I really, really admire about you is um, you had a couple of books come out in YA and you weren't happy and you weren't enjoying that process. And, you know, most people, it's hard to break into publishing at any level. Um, and so you try and figure out any way you can to stay. But you at that point said, this isn't making me happy. And so you stepped away, which kind of blew my mind. Um, and you used that time to really be very sort of thoughtful about what you did next. And one of the things that you did is worked a lot with horses, um, which I find terrifying, but which, yeah. which ended up helping. So how did you go about finding your way back to writing, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I guess like I like uh, it's such like a separate thing for me. I mean, as obviously, you know, and like a lot of people who know me know, like basically six years ago, I got my first book deal, which was a YA book deal. And then very shortly thereafter, my husband died. Um, so because those two events happened at the same time, it, it's like they became sort of like very much like conflated and it kind of tainted in a way that whole experience. Like I felt like sort of guilty that I had like this huge success while that was happening. I had like total trauma, like trauma brain. So you're everything, you're, you know, you're not like thinking logically, like nothing's really sort of making sense. It was like just a really kind of dark time. And, and of course, like, obviously, like I did everything I could to promote the book. And I, and I was really glad that I was able to have that and like proud of it. But it also um, kind of, you know, like the whole um, like experience of losing my husband really like sunk into, into my writing. So I wasn't really enjoying writing, you know, and I felt like I was just kind of like doing it almost obsessively, like trying to kind of like get somewhere and thinking that it would help me feel better. And it just wasn't. Um, so 
like you said, like I totally like took a step back. Like I parted ways with my agent. Like I was like, I'm not going to do this anymore. It's not making me happy. Like I need to figure out something else. And like that thing, like you said, like it was horses. Like when I was younger, I used to ride horses. So I had like when I was married, I lived in London. Like I was there for like 10 years. So I moved back to America and I got a job at a dude ranch, as you know, like in rural Northern California. And I'm over here thinking like, okay, this is going to be like this big, like healing, you know, summer. And I'm going to be spending all this time with horses in this beautiful place. And I get to this ranch and like very quickly thereafter, I was like, no, this is not what I expected, like at all. Like it was like kind of spooky. And like, I was around people who maybe weren't like the best people. Um, and it was just like this really kind of scary experience uh, out in the woods, like in isolation, you know, with people who maybe didn't want to be around other people. And mm -hmm. like, I, you know, I ended up leaving, like, as you know, like after like six weeks, it kind of went too far. And I was like, I'm gonna leave now. But like, as I'm leaving, like, I'm like, dude, this is like the perfect setting for a thriller. You know what I mean? Because it's like, you're just <laughs> Left out there and you're like at the mercy of of other people and and you know people like stories kind of like are like wildfire out there you know what i mean like they just like spread and you don't know what's real and what's not so i kind of like took all of those aspects from that experience and then wrote this and then ended up putting it in that in this book so it was just like a really weird thing because it was totally like me being like you know i don't want to write and i'm going to kind of stop writing but at the end of the day like i am a writer you like i can't help that like yeah. i've been like you know reading and like creating stories my whole life so it's like that wasn't really possible, to, but, but like to completely stop. But I think I just needed to like draw that line in the sand and kind of like, I guess like almost like feel like safe to be like, you know, I can take this or leave it. It's not like going to define me. It's not yeah. like the only thing in my life, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Which I, yeah. Which I really, which I really admire. And like, I, I think it turned out great. Um, yeah. 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 About being a storyteller because, you know, we know each other for years and I used to, I still do, in fact, when Eliza plays with children, I, I eavesdrop because you you weave the most fascinating narratives around like, like the little leftover McDonald's toys from the eighties that your mom has inexplicably saved. Um, and like, anyway, yes, like, and, and I think that's one of the things that, that can be hard for people to understand. Like if you're a storyteller, you're a storyteller and like you can't, you can't not be one the way that you are one might change might shift um it might go dormant for a while but like i i was not at all surprised when you when you kept writing but i was but i i just really admire the way that you were able to take a step back and say like this isn't nourishing me anymore and then like gradually found a healthy way back yeah to it. Like, really cool yeah. and like i've talked about this before but like the thing is with writing is that it's such like it's like such an emotional thing like you really connect into like with your like psyche and your anxiety mm -hmm. Like a very mm -hmm. can be very therapeutic, but if you're going through like an extremely dark time, then mm -hmm. you're doing that and you're just bringing up really dark stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's like yeah. I feel like I in that way, like I almost needed to like get like distance, like move out of England, like kind of start over, like with that intention to be able to mm -hmm. get to the point where like it wasn't that hard. Like it was still hard. Like when I was writing, if I disappeared, like I was still crying all the time. You know what I mean? But like it was like better. And now I feel like I'm finally like. <laughs> finally getting to the point where it's like okay like this i can have fun doing this also <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, so one of the things one of the other things that i really admire about you is you're you're one of the most genuinely honest people that i know right like you you tell the truth emotionally you tell the truth like you just are a very very honest person which i really admire because um that's not my default <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we all we all re react to being raised um, in big families different ways. And mine was to be the good child and like never make any waves. Right. Um, but I feel like your honesty comes through so in such interesting ways. And if I disappear, because you write a really challenging narrator, you write a narrator who never asks us to like her. Um, which is hard to do, right? Because there's always the fear that if you don't kind of pull back, if you don't give them some like redeeming qualities or find and find a way in for the reader to connect to them, that they're not going to, and it's not going to go well. But for me, what I connected to so much with Sarah, I mean, like even the descriptions of her driving, I'm like, oh my gosh, that is what it feels like to drive. And like, she's so high anxiety and she's so, um, she's so interior, right? Like everything is happening all the time in her head. And she's constantly dissecting things. And I love that. I feel like you write really, really like honest characters. 
um, in ways that come across as authentic, but not necessarily easy, which I really admire. There's not a question in there. That's just an observation. Um, <laughs> I'm like, 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 aiming toward a question, but really look just, this is great. I do have to ask though, my, <laughs> my favorite scene in this book. Oh no. Favorite scene that gave me so much secondhand embarrassment was the scene, there's a scene where Sarah visits a high school classroom as a writer. <laughs> and I I died reading that scene. Um, how much, how much of I, I don't want to say how much of yourself did you put into Sarah because obviously all of our characters are always ourselves, but I just how did you go about building Sarah as a character, I guess? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think like one of the words that you said like really popped out, which is anxiety. Because I like, I have, like I have anxiety. Like it, it kind of goes up and down like in different times mm -hmm. of my life. Um, but like when you're kind of like suffering from like say like a severe anxiety attack or like a panic attack, one of the things that is kind of like the most scary is that you kind of can't trust your own instincts. So you might feel like something is wrong or like, you know, something bad's about to happen. And I know it. And like, oh, this is connected to this. And like, it doesn't really make sense. Mm -hmm. um, you can't really trust your own like mind. Like you have to almost like rely on other people like that you trust or whatever. Um, so I, I kind of like took that kind of, I guess, like feeling, you know, mm -hmm. and she goes into things and like what becomes, I think so scary is that she feels like she doesn't know if she can trust anyone, like almost including herself, you know, like mm -hmm. she believes that something bad has happened, but then she questions, is that, is that true? Like it has it, or am I, you know, is this like coming from me? Like, who do I, I don't know Rachel, but I think I really know Rachel, you know, like all that kind of just like second guessing, mm -hmm. um, like feelings of anxiety. And then also like I tried, I put a lot of stuff that I would say, like, I'm afraid of being as a woman. Like, I think that like, as a woman, like you're afraid of being the weird one, mm -hmm. like the crazy one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or even just being vulnerable. Yeah. Like that's like, that can be really, really scary. And I feel like you get like attacked for like, even like the hint of those kind of emotions. So I definitely try to like put all of like my fears about being mm -hmm. perceived a certain way into like a character, probably like mm -hmm. as a way to like, you know, like put a, get control of that kind of feeling, you know? Yeah, so. yeah. Well, and I, loved, I loved your observations about, you know, because a lot of times we don't get characters who are in their mid thirties who don't fit into like a very specific role and that's Sarah, right? Like she isn't a wife, she isn't a mother, she doesn't have a successful career. Um, and so she's very much on the fringes of society. And like, you know, what do you do when everybody who looks at you is like, well, but why aren't you this other thing? Um, and so she comes to, you know, to very much define herself by a parasocial relationship. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, which we've, we've talked about researching parasocial relationships. Um, <laughs> we're just, you know, we're just gonna reference all of our Sunday chats. Um, okay, I wanna know a little bit about your writing process. Like I, I because I know a lot of people who come to these are writers or want to be writers. Um, and, and they always ask, how do you write a book? And, and the answer to how you write a book is however it gets done. But I do always find it really fascinating to hear about others writers, uh, like other writers writing processes. So, so like with this book, what was your process? Yeah. I mean, you know what? I feel like it like, so depends like on the book. Mm -hmm. um, like, but I guess at the end of the day, like I'm learning more about myself and like learning more to accept the writer that I actually am and not the writer that I would like to be. Which is so <laughs> important, right? Like that's, that's a really important lesson to learn because we all have this like idealized version of like, this is this is the type of writer that I'm gonna be. This is how it's gonna work and it's not. And the sooner you can like come to terms with, this is how my brain works and this is how I create stories and work with that instead of against it, then you know, you're gonna be yeah. happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like it's I guess it's been different depending on the book. For this book specifically, like I was working as a horseback riding instructor like in Los Angeles um, mm -hmm. and like riding horse camps like seven days a week. Um, mm -hmm. So I would wake up like two hours before I was supposed to go to work and I would just write as much as I could. Like usually probably I would say in that amount of time like a thousand words and then also be able to get ready for work. And then I would go to work all day and then I would get home and like go to sleep when I got home from work. Like I had like my, for me, the social life is the first thing to go um, when it comes to writing, because especially like when you're older, like you can't like really, you know, be going out and stuff like that. I don't know. And I'm very obsessive. Like I think both of us are really obsessive. So for me, it's just like doing that consistent thing every single day and like making it a priority. Like for me, like, like, I, you know, I was working 
a lot. I wasn't making a lot of money. Like I, I mean, I had like some, you know, money left over for my book. Otherwise I wouldn't have even been able to live in LA. I couldn't have lived off of my salary. So it was like, just being like, okay, like I really need to like prioritize this and, and, and you definitely have to make sacrifices. Cause I did not have a social life at all that time. Mm -hmm. Um, and then mm -hmm. like right now, um, it's like a little bit more chilled cause I don't have that job, um, anymore. So like, you know, I'll like take my dog for a walk and then I'll work on whatever my priority project is for like all morning until mm -hmm. like noon. And then like, you know, take my, my dog for another walk, <laughs> like go for a run. And then I'll like work <laughs> on my secondary like project. You know, you're always trying to do the first thing kind of first when you're, I'm the most creative probably in the morning. But another thing that I've mm -hmm. learned that you know i used to have all these kind of rules about like oh i can only write if and i think that when you have to when you have to do so many different projects and you have so many people like obviously kind of relying on you you like realize that you can't i can't have those rules anymore yeah. i have to be able to write whenever i need to you know mm -hmm. yeah you can't you can't be precious about the process <laughs> yeah yeah that yeah is. very very true um okay so i have another question you and this one kind of breaks my brain because not only do you write if i disappear but you're also developing it for television so you've written the book and then you've been able to remove yourself from the story that exists and kind of move into how can we take what this story is and translate it into a completely different medium so yeah. what is what is that like <laughs> well let me tell you no, <laughs> um, I mean I think like the biggest thing was like before you know I actually moved to LA like initially like I thought like I was gonna be pursue screenwriting mm -hmm. like when I moved I mean obviously you know when I first moved to LA and started writing if I disappeared so I moved to LA and I was like oh I'm gonna be like a screenwriter I got all every book I could get this is like always what I do the same thing I did when I wanted to be a novelist I got mm -hmm. like every single book I could get I like read them all um, and kind of like learned, I guess, like how you're supposed to like approach these kind of stories and blah, blah, blah. But then also like in doing that and researching it, I realized, oh, there's like literally no way to get into this business. Um, so I kind of put that aside because I had this cool idea, like I had like a cool hook, but I was like, I can't become a screenwriter because it's like very difficult. Like it's virtually impossible. It's not like the same, I guess, as publishing where there is a clear route. Everyone gets in a different way. So yeah, it can feel really inaccessible. So. Mm -hmm. I was like, let me just write it as a book. But um, because I had, I guess that is what I'm getting at is because I had like all that backlog of research when I actually was able to be like presented with this opportunity where like there were people who were like willing to like have me work with them on something. Like I already had all, had learned everything I needed. Not, oh gosh, everything I needed to know. Not everything I needed to know, but I had learned like enough about it that I wasn't like a complete, you know, I mean, yeah. I'll, like I have a lot to learn and make like, you know, I'm sure like silly mistakes. And I work with the most nicest, loveliest people who are willing to like help me, you know. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think that like a big part of it was just researching how how those stories are told. Like and there there's like a kind of um, like logic to it, you know, mm -hmm. like just like there is in like a book. So like whatever I wrote in the book, like it, it it's not obviously the book is like an interior monologue. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of stuff like happens in the character's head or is related to like senses or I can like tell you, you know, all this kind of stuff. So but when, when I'm having it on screen, like it has to be creating like the same feeling mm -hmm. but in a completely different way because it has to be visual, you know? Yeah. 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 Which is such an interesting like, you know, I feel I've, I've always felt that the best adaptations are ones that tell the best story for the medium they're telling it for. Right. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah. That's a thing. Thing. I want to in the book. You got to be, I think for me, I think it's so important to say like, okay, like everything's on the table. Like I don't even, I haven't read my book in like over a year. It's like, I was doing like interviews today and like people would ask like questions like, I think that, yeah, I think that's what happens. Like yeah. when they something really specific, I was like, uh, cause you want to like keep it like loose so mm -hmm. that you're not attached to something that maybe would be to your detriment. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's the same with like revisions. Like if you get attached to something that's good in a, in like a draft, it can like potentially ruin the entire rewrite because you're just trying to make it that thing work when you should you're be trying, trying to make that one thing work. Yeah. 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 Whereas like, I always try and view my books as entirely interchangeable parts, right? Like it's a car. You can take things out. You can put things in. It's still going to be a car that gets you where you need to go. Um, but yeah, like you have to be able to sub things in and out and not get to. And the other thing I found is like, if I really, really love a scene, it's usually because of like two lines of dialogue. 
that I'm really yeah. proud of. And guess what? I can pull those out and put them somewhere else. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, okay. Um, and that's funny that you say that about doing the interviews because it's so true, right? Because in publishing, you're working like a year, 18 months ahead. And so by the time the book comes out, you're like, especially if you're writing series, writing series is the worst because the book comes out and you're you're like in the middle of drafting the next book. So people were asking you specific questions and you're like, yeah. I mean, the good thing about this one is because I yes. am like still like working on like developing the TV thing. Like I am still like in that world. Like, I don't yeah. know, like what what's actually in the book? Like what's in a draft of a version of like uh, an idea? You know what I mean? Like it's like, yes. it's all, you know. Indeed. Yeah, because it's been there's so many versions and you carry them all. You carry all of the draft yeah. in your head all the time. You know, all the things that the book has been. Um, yeah, yeah. It's always it's always an interesting thing. My favorite is when and I actually genuinely love this, but it's always funny to me when people on like social media are like, I can't believe what you did in chapter 32. And I'm like, I don't even know what the chat like I guarantee you I got the chapter numbers wrong when I wrote it because I can't count sequentially. Um, I definitely don't know what's in chapter 32. Yeah. You're like, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, what was the hardest part of writing this book and the easiest part of writing it? Well, um, you know, I think, okay, well, I mean, I think like I, the, I, I struggled with like probably the ending. That was like probably the big thing. So like I rewrote the second half of the book like three times, like all the way through mm -hmm. um, with different outcomes. Uh, I think, and I think part of it was like, I was trying to force an ending because I would like look at other people's books and I'd be like, oh, well, I need to do something that's going to be like, you know, like fit like this sort of theme or be different than this. And it's like, so I was trying to force the character into like uh, shapes that didn't make sense. So that was kind of mm -hmm. like probably the most, like I would say time can, time consuming part. Um, mm -hmm. And then the easiest part, like I think that once like, um, so I had this like this cool idea, I thought like with like, you know, someone who's obsessed with the true crime podcast and then the host like disappears. And I thought that was like a really cool hook. But I didn't really know like how to get the host into the book in a way because like obviously we never uh, meet her, you know. Um, so when I read the book You uh, by Carolyn Kepnes, mm -hmm. famously a TV show, um, and that book is like in the sort of like second uh, person tense, and it has also that kind of like whole obsessive quality that mm -hmm. like really like unlocked the voice for me. And so like I think that once I had like that influence, that made that the voice. Like not like easy. Nothing's really ever easy, um, but you know it. It like made it possible. Let's say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It is always interesting. Like, um, and it says so much about reading widely, right? Because sometimes, like, the smallest thing can unlock something for you, or you see something that's yeah. done so well. Um, which which makes me wonder, um, because I know that being a writer has changed the way that I read, especially the types of things that I write. But just reading in general has really changed for me. Has watching television changed for you now that now oh, that you're like yes, everything ruined? <laughs> right? right? I, I keep going like, oh, no, I need to. I'm, 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 very, an, I'm a very analytical person. I think for, you're yeah. probably we are kind of similar our brains. Yeah. But I definitely am like always trying to break down stuff and like I always want to know like I like to know the ending of a book before I even read it because I mm -hmm. want to be like I want to be like engaged in like how they got there and like the mechanics of it like I find super interesting and yeah. I'll always like, anytime there's like you know a good scene instead of just like enjoying that good scene and like being in the moment I'll be like oh that was a good scene because yeah. and it's like oh my gosh just yeah. <laughs> How did they do this thing? Let me ruin this for myself by things. Yeah, why, why do I like this? One? Why, why don't you? Oh, this like it's like this is like so tedious. Come on, girl. But I mean, I enjoy it. That's the thing is like I do like I like my, what I like watching now. Like what I get like really into is like watching people talk about how they how something was made. So mm -hmm. like all the about how this movie was made and like what was the process and like who was involved and who was the producer and what was the idea. Like I like that. You know, mm -hmm. it's a Gotta get into the mechanics thrill ride, you know. <laughs> but it is fascinating, and like, and it's interesting too. Coming from the book industry, like I've talked with screenwriters and even playwrights, and I've been like, you know, I only need like three people to say yes. Like, I need my agent to say yes. I need an editor to say yes, and I need to, whoever approves acquisitions for that editor to say yes, and then I can make a book. But like television shows, it's like you need so many different levels of yes. 
It is it's like a wonder that anything ever gets made, right? How does anything ever get made? Yeah. That probably what happens is like some huge, you know, somebody huge comes on and then it's like, they get all the yeses. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's like boom, yeah. boom. They're the person no one says no to. Like everyone's doing well, in my opinion. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Okay. Um. We'll do a few quick questions and then we'll move to audience questions. So, so audience, hello. Um, if you have questions, drop them in the ask a question box. If you see questions there that you really want us to talk about, vote them up. Um, what was your favorite recent read? And then yeah. time I get asked this question, I forget every book I've ever read. So, yeah. Okay. I'll literally do my most, re my most recent. So another one that's actually at my publisher, Berkeley, um, it, Nixa Effia um, wrote this book called mm -hmm. Dead Dead Girl, which is like, it's like this sort of like Harlem based mystery in like the 1920s, like jazz age. And it's like uh -huh. a uh, female, like lesbian black protagonist who is like this super like sassy and like a acerbic um, character who's just like super fun. And she's mm -hmm. built this amazing like world in Harlem, like with like her family and her friends and these like sort of nightclubs. Mm -hmm. And it's just like so, so well done and engaging mm -hmm. and like yeah just like a really clean like fast fun read so yeah Ooh, I would definitely read it. and also i love reading historical because now i know how hard it is to write and i never want to do it again <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate other people putting in that work um my books like let alone history <laughs> yeah seriously oh man somebody's like when are you gonna do historical fiction again i'm like when i forget how hard it was the first time so probably never um <laughs> okay what are you um speaking of television what are you watching right now that you're enjoying oh my gosh oh um, i mean probably both of us with cobra kai <laughs> my favorite is i texted eliza on new year's Day, and i'm yeah. like hey what are you doing do you want to come hang out and she's like well i honestly See, I'm just walking, watching, walking on Cobra Kai the whole day, and I was like, "I, I envy your life right now." Wait, what? Is, I think it just jumped. What did you say? Oh, I just, I just was joking that um, on on New Year's Day, I texted you, and I was like, "Hey, what are you doing?" And you're like, "I'm walking my dog and watching Cobra Kai the whole day." And I was like, "Oh, oh that's I love that's Cobra Kai!" Yeah, yes. Cobra Kai is really great. But I watched it by myself, and it wasn't as fun. And then uh, mm -hmm. when I like. Grew watched it with my brother then it was like a lot more fun i was more into it that's like a, you know you got like that with with a family it's that's like a fun one to analyze because there's like just so many different like elements like at play yeah um, and i always love a short episode i gotta say it's true it's true like i find i appreciate them more and more um but it is fun like it's interesting there are shows that i prefer to watch by myself because i find them embarrassing if other people are watching them with me. <laughs> um, and then there are shows that are enhanced by watching them with other people because like i don't know yeah that's interesting yeah I mean, lately I've been, to be honest, I've been watching a lot of like really old movies. Like I'm really into like the old screenplays. So like I watched mm -hmm. um, this movie HUD with Paul Newman and then like The Hustler I watched again, which is like one of my like all time favorite movies for some reason. Like I really like these like super dark movies that are like I just love old screenplays because people like really like put it all out there. Like they tried yeah. to like really say something like every five minutes. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like everything's highly symbolic and like mm -hmm. meaningful. Like I, I really do like that kind of like, you know, high intensity kind of writing, you know? Yeah. When well, there's such interesting like capsules of when they were made too. Like we watched um there's a movie well, there's several movies called the Wax Museum, right? And it's the same movie remade, I think, three times. And it was really fascinating to watch because the one made in the 30s or 40s was like really liberal. The main character was the single divorcee who is very heavily implied, you know, has healthy sexual relationships without really any attachment. Um, and and then the, the one that was made in the 60s was like super repressed. Like the the girl who gets murdered, of course, is the is the roommate who goes out too much. And like the, the woman main character no longer saves herself and really has no, no function in the story. But it was interesting seeing like, okay, this is how each you know, these time periods yeah, for sure. story. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. I think that was all my, that was all my quick questions. So I'm going to look at what people have asked. Um, what is your favorite part about writing? Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. No, I actually do have an answer for this. Uh, getting paid. 
<laughs> That's my little joke. Um, no, honestly, um, my favorite like part is is I think is when you kind of get other people on board. So when you get to the point where you're getting like kind of like collaborators or like getting like a sort of like, you know, like team behind you. Like so for me, like when I found like my agent, mm -hmm. uh Sarah Beddingfield, who's absolutely amazing. And then when she put me in touch with Hillary uh Zates Michael, who's my film agent, also amazing. Um, and then we got the deal obviously with my editor, Jen Monroe, and then had all these people like jump on and publicity and marketing. Like that's like the coolest thing I think. I I really like the collaborative aspect. I don't I, I don't like uh, being a, I don't, I do like being alone. But I don't know. Like writing alone is hard. Like you kind of yeah. feel like, I don't know what I'm doing this for. And when you get other people that jump on that, like believe in you mm -hmm. and are like, kind of like, you know, like, I guess like helping you, you know, to helping the book to get somewhere. I mean, I wouldn't, it wouldn't be anywhere without them. That's like the coolest part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. Like I got my first revision for um, my my novel is coming out next year, which is actually my my first adult book. And like it was like, I'm so excited because it's going to be a ton of work, but like, but it's work guided by someone who cares about the book just as much as I do and who like genuinely gets what I'm trying to do with it. And it is like, it's so exciting to me. And, and sometimes writing because you're so solitary, I sometimes get to the point where I'm like, I don't know if this is good. Mm -hmm. I know that I don't like it, but I don't know if it's good. And so that's when I have to like, send it to like a friend and be like, please just like, don't give me edits. Just tell me like, am I right to think this is good? Or are you like, Meh. and what? honestly, I have had some where they were like, Meh. and I was like, okay, like I get stuff that I have to write this, but it's not something that other people are connecting with. So that's fine. Like I can move along, yeah. but like, but yeah, I agree. Like I really, really enjoy the collaborative. Um, yeah. Yes. I think that's one of the hardest things about writing too, is like how disheartening it can be sometimes. Like you go, everyone goes through like these ups and downs. Um, and I have like this group, a lot of them are here, the Berkeleys, and we talk about this all the time. But you know, it's like we go through like these times when we like have the most intense like self doubt. And you're like, what am I even doing this for? Like, especially if you're writing a book that hasn't sold or that may, might not sell. And you know how much work goes into getting it yeah. there because you've done it, you know, once before. And you just don't, you don't want to like mm -hmm. waste your time. You also want to like have fun and explore this idea you love. So it's like very yeah. much, like, it is very difficult. And uh, and the best, the best part of it, it has, is for me has been like engaging with other people, even like having like a support group like that, like I have with all these other mm -hmm. authors, like it has made such a difference. I didn't do that with my YA book because I was just in like my grief bubble, you know, of like, I'm just going to be miserable because I deserve it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so this time, like I didn't do that. And like, I'm so like, that's been like the best part and it helps you to like enjoy it. And, mm -hmm. and it also gives you a space to complain about the negative stuff so that you just get it out of you. you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because you know there there are spaces where complaints are appropriate and spaces where they aren't, and so like small groups who are all doing the same thing and understand like yeah, that's an appropriate place to complain. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and it makes we it all feel so lucky and blessed. Like, and we all say that you know to each yeah. other. Like, we do ever sort of like say you know ah this kind of hurt my you know, this kind of hurt me or whatever yeah. it is. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like you have you literally have a dream job, right? Like. Yeah. We have a job that so many people would love to have, mm -hmm. and it's amazing, and you can be grateful for. But at the same time, like there are some parts that are not fun sometimes. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Next question. Oh, this is a good one. Um, why do you think people are so drawn to true crime podcasts? Oh man. Okay. So I've talked about this kind of a lot today. I did like a like a little radio tour thing. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, I think that there's uh, like a few different elements at play. And I actually talked about why I like women specifically. And I think that that does make up the bulk of the audience. So I will I will talk to that specifically yeah. again. Um, I think that one of the reasons is that, um, you know, women are much more likely to be victims of, of yeah. violent crimes or yeah. to have experienced trauma. So I think that it gives you like a safe space to kind of address that, talk about that, um, uh, feel a sense of control or like having a kind of, you know, feeling like prepared in a way for those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I've actually got really into true crime after Alan died just because that whole experience was so traumatic. And there was like literally no space where you could actually talk about trauma, like apart from like that kind of space. So I like started watching like Dateline just cause it made me feel like less alone. Yeah. And then from there, like I discovered like the true crime podcast, like my favorite murder and, and crime junkie. And this is where like another element comes in. And I think this is specifically uh, related to those people that that started those podcasts like Karen and Georgia they're like these super funny mm -hmm. super intelligent super very honest mm -hmm. a very like, open like they talk about mental health 
Um, they're just like the coolest people. And mm -hmm. because of who they are as people, they have created this community that reflects the way that they are. Yeah. So like I went to like live events, obviously when those were a thing and like, I was like, ta like taken, like I was so surprised by how like open and like joyful and friendly, like those spaces were like specifically mm -hmm. because of, of the people who, who would like do true crime now. Yeah. So I think that that's another element of it is, is because that just, there's such a great community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All good points. All right. Um, <laughs> How did publishing your debut impact your overall writing process? How would you describe your writing process now versus in the past? Um, I think that I have just probably, I guess, like maybe learned to be like more accept, like I said earlier, kind of like learn to be more accepting of like um, what my process is. Like, mm -hmm. so this year, like, okay, so after I got like my first book or whatever, then I was contracted to write a second book this year. And of course this year was like the year from uh, H-E double hockey stick for uh -huh. my mom. Um, and so like I had written an outline as part of my contract. And so I'm like trying to like stick to this outline, right? Mm -hmm. And I want to be a writer who sticks to their outline because that's like what a good writer does. And like, that's what I should be doing. Like, I promise this, I'm going to deliver that, you know? And like, it was not working for mm -hmm. like, entire year i'm like trying to make this thing work and finally it got to the point where it was like basically like i guess we were doing another kind of like edit and i had like you know like five weeks or something not that like mm -hmm. i you know i mean we probably would have had more time but i was like dude you need to this is the point like you need to like give up on this like dream of who you think you should be as a writer and you need to like redo this because you don't like it um and if you don't like it like what's the point Mm -hmm. So I like, you know, messaged my editor and I was like, I think that let's change the book in like this way. Like I gave her like kind of a new pitch that I thought worked better. And then I just like slammed like five weeks of just like writing and I was moving house and like writing my first screenplay. Like it was just like intense. Like I did not have a day off, but I was like, I got to do this. Um, yeah. So, and then I just wrote like that whole book and sent it off. And like, luckily my editor liked it and you liked it. I loved it. I'm so, I'm already like, I can't wait for our events next year. Um, yeah, I loved it. And like, I think that's such an interesting thing because sometimes um, these time periods that really derail us. Um, so we think that we know what we're going to write. We think we know what we're going to do. And then we have these time periods that just completely derail us and force us to look at things from a different perspective. And it ends up like creatively, like as painful as it is to go through that, it ends up being like a really good thing. Like if last year hadn't been last year, I wouldn't have written the two things that I ended up selling because they weren't in my plan, right? They weren't like, but because everything was so disrupted, I was like, well, I just, I just have to do something else. And you know, it, and it, and it worked, which sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, no, that's but, exactly like I that's exactly what I've said about this book. Cause I was like, I took a risk and it like paid off. It does not always pay off. Does not always pay off. I definitely got lucky that that worked out. I will not try it that way again. It, there was a lot of tears. Like it was like a year of tears and then a month of like working. I mean, it was not, it's not a method that I like aspire to. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it was not a fun process. Like the result is fantastic, but not a great, like not an enjoyable process. <laughs> no, no it's, it's yeah. not very relaxing. Yeah, 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 it's true. Um, Favorite true crime podcast? I know you, you talked about my favorite oh, murder. No, no favorite? I mean, no, I can't. That's terrible. I can't do it. I mean, like the ones that I really like are like my favorite murder, crime junkie, uncover. Um, I really love Dateline. Like that's just like, I mean, that's like kind of like a family thing. Like my, my mom likes that too. And I like mm -hmm. love their storytelling. Um, Cause that's like a comfort one for me. And then like, yeah. I feel like there's, you know, there's like a lot of like really great ones that pop up like every now and again, but those are like my go-tos that I like always, I listen to every episode, you know? Thanks. Okay, question. Do you like unsolved mysteries? Oh, uh, I haven't seen the new the new ones. Okay. I hate it. And I know okay. that the title is Unsolved Mysteries. Oh yeah, that was every, 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 every episode, I'm like, are you kidding me? You just never know. Yeah, yeah that's so true. Maybe that's why I've avoided it. I need a, I need some resolution. Yeah, right? But I think it goes back to what you were saying about why why we're drawn to true crime is that it's that sense of like we know the world is violent and scary and this gives us some sense of almost like control it's like i'm i'm choosing you know what what i'm learning about what i'm thinking about but yeah unsolved mysteries mm -mm, no no hate yeah it. yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, well you know that's 
I actually think Unsolved Mysteries is fine. Because <laughs> you haven't watched it. Watch an episode and get back to me. Um, okay, so Colton Brazier, who, who seems, he seems like a very charming person. Um, <laughs> Does when writing a book, is there something you do before writing to get back into the headspace of the story you're telling? Well, that's a good question. Like, is there any sort of ritual? Like, I know that I tend to listen to one song on repeat because as soon as I per turn that song on, it tells my brain it's time to think about this thing because, like, I I have a really hard time focusing. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of use that almost as, like, self-hypnosis. Do you have anything like that? I have like I don't do that podcast. Like I don't do that anymore, but I definitely have had like a you know a, a one song that I listen to mm -hmm. obsessed with while writing something. So that's like mm -hmm. interesting. Um, you know, honestly, I feel like it's it's for me. It's just like sit down, like feel feel like you're gonna cry because you don't want to do it, and then just do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I definitely don't like I wish I could have like a ritual I mean you know I've actually like I think I've been impressed by my brain's ability lately to like compartmentalize because like I said like when I was working on my book too like I was also working on this script and I felt like if I just as long as I take like an hour away mm -hmm. it's interesting because like the amount I can do on one book in a day is is still the same if I'm working on two projects so like, I can do you know whatever you know project number one for like this amount of time and then mm -hmm project number two and do it for like kind of like the same amount of time and it feels mm -hmm. like uh my brain is able to do that whereas if i tried to do project number one yeah you know like for double the time couldn't i'd tap out that's really interesting <laughs> yeah because i've never been able to work on multiple projects at the same time my brain is very much like an all or nothing um and starting is really hard for me but once i start and i get momentum then like i kind of just like crash through it but i've yeah. never been able to work on multiple <laughs> at a time do you think it helps that they're different formats um you know i don't it doesn't really i don't think it really matters it matter. yeah. i mean it maybe you know it's also because like this i guess like this i feel like i've lived in this world for such a long time but mm -hmm. i definitely have learned i feel like to because I, I i mean you you write really fast like yeah. i can like usually like write something and know where i'm going to be tomorrow and i can just put that aside and not yeah. think about it until i sit down again yeah you know or yeah. i can just keep writing um but like i yeah i guess i i i think right now i'm having a good like a good moment with it i guess like there, there'd be times that you'd talk to me and i'd be like i can't write anything <laughs> like this yeah. is terrible it's so yeah. hard so it does depend i think i'm having like a good moment so i'm probably being false positive no that's good though you have a good moment um let's see <laughs> Who sent the flowers, Eliza? Oh, okay, this is a question for the audience. I got yeah. some flowers today. You can see them in the back, the tall ones. These are from my agent. This is from my friend Magda. Don't know who those are from. Maybe my publisher, maybe you. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. That's the mystery. I so asked we, that question. Yeah, we, we brought it. We're leaving them. until we find out. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, yes. And and as Romans just put um, a reminder that you have signed plates available. So when you order, there's a the purchase link right right there. I don't know which direction I am on your screen. Down at the bottom, there's a purchase link. I'll point all directions. There's a purchase link when you buy your book from Romans in the comment section, right, that you want a book plate and you will get a signed book plate from Eliza and, along with your book. You definitely want this book. It's so pretty. It's so good. Like, my sisters were just talking about how, how when they get a chance to read, all they want is like a really good fast moving thriller. And I was like, Eliza has you covered um, this year and next year. Um, <laughs> all right, so anything, let, let me check the questions, just to make sure I didn't miss anybody. Um, oh, this is a fun question. Um, since you're developing If I Disappear for TV, do you have a dream cast? I actually hate this question when people ask me, but I like asking it to other people. Yeah, I mean, I guess like not really. Like, I, I love so many people. Like, I, you could name, like, I mean, I like, I'm very much like a, you know, I've always been like super, like, I wanted to be an actress when I was in high school. Yeah. So I've always been like a huge, like, fan of, like, I would say just so many people. So I could name like a bajillion people that I would be like over the moon to have. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, anybody, but anyone. yeah. I, 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 I don't think it has means it's being made. So yeah. Dream Pop right there is one that exists. 
Well, and then there's like people that like, if you could get them, you'd like, I will rewrite the whole book for you. I don't, I'm not going to like think of somebody that's perfect for this. Like I want it for you. I want you. <laughs> we, will, we will rewrite it to your specifications. Very, very true. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, Eliza, for doing this. Thank you, everyone who came. Um, this was just so fun. I love this book. I love Eliza. I think she's just an astonishingly good writer, and her books are so fun and so engaging and so different. Um, I hope that you enjoyed as much as I do. If you haven't read it yet, um, don't forget to ask for the book plate in the comment section when you order from Bromans. Thank you so much, Bromans, for hosting us. Um, yeah. It was lovely having you both. It was such a fun and lively talk. And thank you to everyone who uh, asked such uh, fun questions. And for the uh, chat, you, you guys had a very active chat, which is always great. Um, again, we do have signed book plates available. Just click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen. It will take you to our website. And just make sure to write book plates in the comment section when you are checking out. Also, for those who tuned in late, don't worry. This talk is uh, recorded, so you'll be able to access it later. Uh, just use the same <laughs> link. Forever on the internet. Um, and I think that about covers it. Stay safe, everyone, and have a good night. All right. Thank you, everyone, so much for coming. It means to me to see you all here. <laughs>